I say it's time to let God arise. So come on, say it with me. Let God arise. I say let him arise in our homes. Let him arise in our hearts. Let him arise in our families. Let him arise in our emotions. Let him arise in our finances. Let him arise in our community. Somebody say let God arise. I think that's one of the key things to being a believer today is are we going to let God arise in our lives or are we going to let fear arise in our lives? I mean, there's a lot of it out there today. Amen. Come on, say, let God arise. Let him arise in this church. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hmm? How many of you understand this morning when you don't allow God to arise in the circumstances of our lives, then how many of you, know, you can have a pretty long week? Hmm? Things can get rough out there. It's rough and tumble. It's like being in one of them stand-up dryers. You just tumble around in the heat. Especially if you live in South Florida. You tumble around in the heat. Amen? Anybody been outside this week? Summer is here. Come on, amen? Hmm? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of us get overwhelmed in a hurry when we get out there in our own strength and we get out there in our own power and we get out there in our own emotion and we're not relying on the Lord through the day. It's easy to not let God arise in our life and it's easy to just get tumbled around like old tumbleweed out in the middle of the desert and everything that hits us just kind of knocks us for another little ride down the road. Amen? Come on, amen? Sometimes we get so consumed with what's happening in the middle of the week that we really just forget sometimes who we are. It's easy to forget who we belong to. It's easy to forget that we're part of a kingdom that has no end. It's easy to forget that we are eternal beings in the midst of stuff that's happening. Come on, huh? And sometimes we forget what kind of power we got because we get out there in our own strength. We get out there in our own emotion. And we get overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. Come on, somebody. Can anybody identify that with, identify with that with me today? Yes. Uh, how many of you are children of God? Yes. How many of you got a different source? Yes. Somebody say, I got a different source. Yes. Hmm? If we're being real today, we can identify with what it means to have a bad week or a stressful week. How many of the nations had a bad week? The nations had a, how many of the nations had a bad six months? Huh? It's been tough out there. I, 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 somebody sent me a picture of Santa Claus in a t-shirt and a pair of jeans leaning over a rail holding a beer. And it said, impeachment, pandemic, economic crisis, uh, inequality, injustice, and riots. That's it. Nobody's getting nothing this year. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a long six months. But how many of you know God is still on the throne in 2020? Yeah. Hmm? God still has a plan for our life. And how many know you can come to church on a Sunday morning full of joy? You can come in here full of peace. You don't have to be overwhelmed with what's going on around you. Matter of fact, how many of you know today that you are the answer for what is going on around you? You are the one that God's called to bring peace into your situation. You're the one that God sent out into the mission field on your job, in your place of business, while you're out in public to bring peace and light and joy to the distraction that's going on in the world today because God's greater. Somebody shout, he's greater. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you. Today, about three guys that had a bad week. Three guys in the Bible that had a bad week. Our text this morning is Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. We're going to start right there in verse 19. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the blazing furnace. <clears throat> so these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Somebody said they were fully dressed. Mm -hmm. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the ability to preach and teach. I thank you for the anointing that's in this house today. 
Father God, I declare that my words will be the words of your spirit and not the words of Jason. And Father, I thank you for entrance into every heart, Lord, every believer in here, everybody on the fence, and, nobody, and people in here that don't believe in you. I thank you, God, for revelation that flows off my mouth to penetrate God through walls to bring revelation that changes us from the inside out. Father, put me on like a coat and wear me today. Have your way in this house. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Somebody say, Christian, wake up. Let God arise. Let God arise. Amen. I think we got a little video we're going to run. Is that right, Michael? Let God arise. Praise the Lord. Everybody say, Christian, wake up. Let God arise. Woo. I mean, we get to a place where we say, Lord, this is tough. Anybody get in their prayer time and say, Lord, this is tough. I don't understand what's going on. I can't make no sense out of it. Things are hard. This don't make no sense to me. Hmm? How many know when you go to God like that, he's not frightened by that. And he's not put off by it. Hmm? How many know he's not diminished by it either. I mean, you can't bring God down. Come on, somebody, huh? Listen, when we find ourselves in a place like that, Jesus just comes along and he says, here I am. And this is the most comforting thing that I think you can hear the Lord say to you. I'm right here with you. I mean, that's the heart of the father for his children. No matter what we face, no matter what our struggle is, no matter how hard it gets. He says, I'm right here with you. Just try that. I'm right here with you. Isn't that good? Come on, amen. Matter of fact, he said something like that to his disciples, didn't he? He told them, he said, I am with you till the end of this age. I'm right here with you. I think sometimes we just need to acknowledge that whatever we're going through, while we're going through it, we just need to look up and say, thank you, Jesus. I know you're right here with me. No matter how bad it gets, no matter what they say, no matter what they did, no matter how hard it was. Thank you, Jesus. I know you're right here with me. Amen. And not only be able to acknowledge it, but be able to accept what he's doing in us while he's right there with us. Because you might not like what you're going through, but he might be doing something in you while you're going through it. Mm? Come on now, amen. Mm? Because the problem for most of us is we just like to be in control. Huh? I lost all my helpers. Come on, huh? We like to be in control. And, And the challenge in our daily walk while we live is to let him have control. It's to really, I think that's probably the biggest act of faith that we have to go through every day. Is to take our hands off of it and let him put his hands on it. Amen. We, we just get used to doing it our way, don't we? We just get used to because we're living in the moment. And we're just making decisions on the fly. And we get just used to doing it our way. Come on, huh? I think if there was ever a time in the history of the world, today is a day that we need to recognize we need to let Jesus be in control. Hmm? We need to let him have control of all of it. Praise the Lord. Huh? That means no matter what we face, we need to be able to take a stand of faith and realize no matter what's going on or what we're looking at, in the end, we win. How many know you're a winner today? Come on, somebody shout, I'm a winner. We are the overcomers. We are the winners. We are the ones that get by. We are the ones that have eternity. We are the ones that get to go to heaven. Amen? That means that no matter what we face, we have to learn how to walk by what we face in faith. Come on, huh? I mean, every now and then, you got to have a, you got to have a little chat with yourself. Come on, my biggest critic is me. I don't know if you're like me. If you're anything like me, the person that puts you down the most is you. Praise the Lord. Sometimes I look in the mirror and i got to straighten myself out. I think I told you this before. I have conversations with myself in the mirror. And sometimes I get mad at myself when I have the conversation. I, I'll be talking to myself and I'll look away and i say, don't you turn away when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Pay attention. Hmm? You ever have them conversations? Kim's yelling on the other side of the house. Who are you talking to? I'm talking to me. I'm not listening very good. Come on, somebody, huh? Hmm? 
Sometimes we just need to sit down and have a conversation with ourselves and understand that God is in control. Sometimes I have to say, Jason, do you realize that your father is still in heaven today? Do you realize that he's still sitting on the throne today? It may look like everything's going crazy around you, but God is still in control. God's still got a call on your life. God's still got purpose for you. Don't put your eyes on what's going on around you. Put your eyes on me because your confidence has, confidence has to be in me. And then I say, okay, that's a good point. You're a good preacher, Jason. Huh? Does anybody talk? Am I the only one that talks to myself like that? Well, if you talk to yourself like that, then you're in good company. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hmm? Sometimes we just got to remind ourselves, let God arise. Let him arise and let his enemies be scattered. He's all powerful. He's almighty. Amen. I believe we're living in a time in the day's age this year that there is a spirit of fear and contempt over the whole world. And especially in this nation. How many know wherever America goes, most of the world follows? And there is a spirit of fear, a spirit of the unknown, a spirit of uncertainty that has been dictating the politics that we live under today. But I want to declare that there is a spirit of faith that comes from heaven. You ain't got to live under a spirit of fear. Come on, huh? I don't think the society and the culture we live in has seen anything yet. We've seen a lot of fear. We've seen a lot of work of the devil. We've seen a lot of uncertainty. But we haven't seen the power of God show up on the scene yet and see the manifestation of redemption and healing and reconciliation. But I want to tell you, it's coming, baby. It's coming to this nation, and we better be ready because God's calling us to lead the charge in it. Amen? Hmm? It don't take a political pundit on CNN to tell you everything's wrong. You can see it. You can see how bad it's gotten. Amen? Especially when people talk about the future. People are all uptight about the future. Huh? Well, I wonder what's going to happen now. Just everything's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't even know what a handbasket is, but people say it. Huh? People are all uptight about the future. I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to lose our rights. We're going to lose our guns. We're not going to be able to have freedom of religion anymore. Let me tell you something. God is on the throne. He's on the throne. This experiment, this great experiment that we call the United States of America is the first time in the history of the world that people ever even had rights. Everybody else lived under an emperor or a king or a dictator. It's the first time in the history world that the people get to make decisions. Come on, somebody. We ought to be counting our blessings. Somebody say, I got to count my blessings. Hmm? I believe that what's going to happen in this country moving forward is going, to be, is going to be birthed in the church through the revelation that God gives the people of God. That God is incumbent upon us as believers to take the love of Jesus to a world that has been estranged to that kind of love. we got the kind of love in the world where everybody like, I love you if you love me. Hmm? I mean, a lot of people get married on that kind of love. Why'd you marry them? Well, I love the way they make me feel. Well, that's kind of selfish. I mean, godly love is not that kind of love. Hmm? Come on, somebody. Amen. Hmm? I just want to tell you, it's not really about right wing or left wing politics. I don't identify myself as a right wing Republican. I don't identify myself as a left wing Democrat. I identify myself as a child of God in the kingdom of heaven. Come on, somebody, huh? That means if you're black, white, brown, or red, if you're lean or mean or tight or tall or bald or fat, come on, somebody. That has no bearing on whether you're my brother and sister. What has a bearing on whether you're my brother and sister is whether you got Jesus in your heart or not. Come on, somebody, huh? Are you a Christian? Do you live in the kingdom? Come on, huh? I recognize that we're living in a divided nation today. There's only one thing that will unite this nation, and it's the power of God. It's not going to be legislation in Congress. It's not going to be an executive order from the White House. It's going to come through the power of God. Amen. And I believe God has called us as Christians to bring the gospel of peace to everybody that's willing to hear it. That's how healing is going to come. Huh? Hmm? I mean, in order to bring that good news, we're going to have to get out. Of, we're going to have to learn how to walk through some situations in our life. We're going to have to learn how to get through by faith. We're going to learn how, how to learn how to stand in the strength of the Lord and let God arise in the midst of our situation instead of acting like the rest of the world. 
I ain't got no help, hardly no. Y'all better hear me today. Say, Pastor, you sound like you're mad. Yeah, I'm mad at the devil. Hmm? I say it's time to let God arise. Somebody say, let God arise. I mean, when we lift God up, he draws all men unto him. That's what my Bible says. The more you lift up Jesus, the more people start looking. At what is he looking at? Oh, what's that? What's that? That looks pretty good. I might need me some of that. I mean, when we lift God up, people look up. I mean, if I walk around like this all the time looking up, everybody's going to start looking up. And go, what's he looking at? When you lift up God, people look to God. When you lift up Jesus, people look to Jesus. When you lift up peace, people look to the peace. When you lift up love, people look to the love. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hmm. Listen to me. Write this down if you can. When I, when I let the light of his love shine in my life, it kills the spirit of fear. Can you put that on the screen for me? When I let the light of his love shine in my life, it kills the spirit of fear. Hmm? And make no mistake about it, people today are afraid. Come on, we've dealt with it, haven't we? Think, I mean, we, it seems like the pandemic was a long time ago. We was afraid, right? Huh? We were wonder what was going on. Everybody's getting sick. Huh? Come on, somebody. How many, how many, some of y'all got masks on because you're still feeling all the pressure of everything that's happened in this nation. Hmm? Come on, amen. Hmm? Praise the Lord. Our society today has been full of anxiety. Full of fear. Hmm? And listen, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're not citizens of America. What I'm saying is we just here on a temporary visa. We're just passing through this thing because my home is in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. My home is with Jesus. So my, my identity is not in the fact that I'm American. My identity is the fact that I'm a Christian. Somebody say, I'm a Christian. Hmm? Now, I believe if you're an American and you are a Christian, then there's a mandate on us as believers to change the society that God caused us to be born in and live in, that God has given us a trumpet to sound and a voice that needs to be heard today in society. That's the calling. I mean, we got to speak out. Tell somebody, you got to speak out. You got to speak out today. We got to preach the gospel. And in order to do that, we got to let God arise. Somebody say, let him arise. And we let him arise by faith. Somebody say, faith is now. Faith is now. Uh, that means it takes place right now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. It takes place in my life right now. God is the God of the eternal now. He is in the moment. On either side of the moment, on top of the moment, and under the moment. Faith is now. It's a now moment. It's an opportunity that God gives us today to step by faith. An opportunity that won't be here tomorrow because it's an opportune moment. It's a kairos moment. It's the moment in life that God says, will you heed the call? Will you step by faith in the rough and tumble of life? Will you stand up and Declare my kingdom. Will you face the stuff that's going on in your life today by faith? Come on, somebody say it's an opportune moment. Go ahead and tell the person next to you, we got to let God arise. We got to let him arise. But in order to do that, we can't be in fear. We got to be in faith. We can't allow the enemy to beat us down with what's going on. We can't allow the enemy to divide us. We can't allow the enemy to sow discord. We are the light in the world. Somebody say, I'm the light. Jesus called me to be the light. Mm. I just think the fear of what's going on in the nation has crept into the church. It's crept into but the hearts of believers. Come on. Come on. If you watch CNN for any amount of time or MSNBC or Fox News, it's easy to get fearful. You can watch the news for an hour and you get done watching the news for an hour and you done ate all your fingernails off. Huh? I plucked your eyebrows out. Am I talking to anybody today? Huh? We get depressed, we get fearful, we get angry, we get frustrated. Listen, I only have you for an hour and a half every week. Huh? If you're not praying every day and reading your Bible every day, if you're not spending time in worship every day, and you're watching the news for an hour every night, God, didn't, God, God don't stand a chance in your life. Let me help you right now. The pundits that you watch on TV do not love Jesus. I'm going to try that one again. The people you're watching on TV do not love Jesus. Huh? If you're watching pundits on TV, most of them are very secular, very progressive. More, there's more homosexuals on CNN giving the news than there is straight people. Somebody ought to help me. Now, I ain't going to shout me down, but I'm telling you the truth. 
what people are, if they're not for God, what you hear will filter through the spirit that's on their life. That's why it says in the Bible, be careful, little ears, what you hear. We sang it in Sunday school, didn't we? Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Where's all my Sunday school people? Be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Hey, you need to look at your TV sometimes and say, Hello, news channel. This ain't a garbage dump. This is my faith meter. Mm. Because what I hear stirs my faith. Mm. I mean, also what you hear will stir your fear. That's why you got to be careful what you hear. See, I know y'all want me to preach for three hours on Sunday, but I can't do it. Even though we probably need it. Praise the Lord. Hey, and it's not just CNN, it's Facebook too. Come on. Uh, you could tell a joke on Facebook and half the people don't know it's a joke. They block you. Huh? Come on, we need a little bit of humor in the world today. Praise the Lord, amen? I would just say everybody, 20 minutes a day on Facebook, after that, cut it off. Make your post and go. I've used that snooze button a lot. Anybody use a snooze button yet? You don't block them, you just hit snooze. I'm taking a time out from you for 30 days. Snooze. Huh? They can, you can snooze people now. Pretty soon they're going to have a ghost button where you can just ghost them. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hmm? I mean, when we tune into what God's doing and what God's revealing in our lives, and when we hear his word, that's the report that should motivate us. It's the word of the Lord that causes us to live by faith. It's the word of the Lord that causes us to overcome. You're not going to overcome watching the news. Huh? Because I promise you, you can watch a half hour on one news channel and go to another news channel. You're going to hear two opposite things. The only thing that's coming out of the news is a bunch of confusion. Come on, somebody. Amen. I just want to say he's a good God. His word is true. Amen. He's a good God. Let the world hear that he's a good God. Let the world hear that he's mighty. Let the world hear that he's a healer. Come on, amen. Somebody ought to help me and all his enemies will be scattered. What the enemy meant for evil in this nation, God's going to turn it for good. What the enemies tried to do to destroy the church and destroy people and cause them to live in fear and cause division through race, God's going to turn it around for the good of this nation. And I believe we're going to see a healing come to this nation that this nation has never experienced in the 200 and some odd years that we've been a country. I think we're going to come out better. Somebody say we're coming out better. Praise the Lord. Hmm? So I just want to encourage you this morning. If we're going to grow in the Lord in 2020, then the process uh, uh, that we need to understand is there's going to have to be growth. And we're going to have to go through some stuff to be able to grow so that God can use us. Come on, if you got your Bibles, look in Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. It says, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a, mighty, in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the, t- oh my God. And he changes the times and the seasons. Watch this. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise. Knowledge to those who have understanding." He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells in him. I thank you. Praise you, O God, my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Somebody say the king's demand. Now listen, I backed up to chapter 2 because I want to lay a little foundation because this is important for us to understand. If you've spent any time in the book of Daniel, then you know what we just read is the prayer and affirmation of God. Daniel prayed and he was affirming who God was. Amen? Because how many know Daniel was put into a position where he not only had to tell the king the interpretation of the dream, but he also had to explain to the king what the dream was. Anybody ever had a recurring dream? It's a dream you have like every night for months. 
and you wake up and you can't hardly remember any of it, but you just remember little pieces of it, and it kind of fits like little pieces of a, of a jigsaw puzzle, but you can't never make no sense of it. This is what was happening with King Nebuchadnezzar. He was having a recurring dream. And in the recurring dream, he kept seeing this statue in the dream, but he couldn't make no sense of it. He didn't know what it meant, and he couldn't understand it because he would wake up and forget parts of what it was. And he got so frustrated, he called all the soothsayers and the magicians and, and all the prophets of the land to come in and tell him. Not only he wanted an interpretation of the dream, but he wanted them to tell him what the dream was. I mean, that's a tough task if you're a prophet. And he got frustrated because nobody could tell him what the dream was. And he said, listen, if you guys can't tell me what the dream is, I'm going to kill you all. That's it. I'm done with all you problems. I'm going to kill. Somebody say he's going to kill them all. Hmm? And so he has this dream, and Daniel hears about it, and he says, tell, go tell Nebuchadnezzar I can help him. So they bring Daniel before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, who are you? He said, I'm Daniel. I'm one of the Hebrew slaves. I'm here as a slave. He said, can you tell me what my dream is and give me the interpretation of it? And Daniel said, no, I really can't, but I can tell you who can there's a God in heaven. He's the creator of the heaven and earth. He can tell you all about that dream that you had and what it means. Come on, amen. And when they couldn't find anybody, Daniel shows up and he interprets the dream. And Daniel is one of the, the Hebrew children who's very intellectual, who actually was a eunuch. How many know what a eunuch is? Do we have to have a biology class? Raise your hand if you know what a eunuch is. Okay, if you don't know what a eunuch is, that means he could never have no children because they cut it off. Hmm? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were eunuchs. They were slaves. And what they would do in that day is they would remove their manhood because they would oftentimes work in the palace. And they didn't want the seed of a slave to impregnate one of the women in the palace. So to make sure the men didn't impregnate the women, they just got rid of their manhood. That's a eunuch. But Daniel was a godly man. Somebody say he was a godly man. These were people that were taken from their land, separated from their faith. They were brought to Babylon in bondage. I mean, Babylon was not like the bondage of Egypt. In Egypt, they were taken into bondage. And they were allowed to keep their tradition. They were allowed to keep their religion. They still practiced Judaism while they were in Egypt. They were allowed to keep their names. But when they were taken off to bondage in Babylon, Babel, Babylon was actually comes from the word Babel, which means confusion from back to the time of the Tower of Babel where God confused the languages where they couldn't understand anything. They take them to the land of confusion and they try to educate them in their centers of education and they change their name and try to change their identity. And that's what they were doing in Babylon. So Daniel is wise. Somebody say he's wise. He interprets the dream. And now all of a sudden, he's no longer treated like a slave. He's, he's given a, a place that, that, that has authority. He's given a place in the king's, uh, in, the, in, in the castle, where he has rule, where he has authority. And he has Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were like his right-hand men. And the king brings them in, and he gives them authority and power over different regions. Come on, somebody. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. And they're no longer treated like slaves because Daniel can interpret a dream. Hmm? They've been given rulership. Now how many of you recognize that King Nebuchadnezzar was smart enough to recognize that there was an all-powerful God, but he wasn't smart enough to serve him? Hmm. Sound like a lot of people in control in this nation, don't it? Hmm? Oh, they recognize God, but they ain't not smart enough to serve him. Come on, somebody. Amen. So Daniel interprets this dream. And in this dream is this statue. And the statue has a golden head, a silver chest, a copper and brass waist and, th and, and thighs, legs of iron, and feet made out of clay and iron. Right? Come on, amen. And he tells, he tells Nebuchadnezzar, that the head of gold represents the nation of Babylon. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, the rule of the Babylonian Empire is setting the stage for what the kingdoms of the earth will look like from this day forward. 
the head of gold. How many know the god that they worshipped in Babylon was a god named Marduk? Marduk was the god of gold. If you look at the statue of Marduk, he was gold. He sat at a table of gold and everything around him was gold. How many know Nebuchadnezzar thought that was pretty cool? Hmm? Marduk, I'm the head of everything in the earth. How many know that could go right to your head? Come on, somebody, amen. The next empire that was to come after the Babylonians was the empire, if you read your history, if you know world history, was the empire of the Persians and the Medes. How many remember the Persians and the Medes? They ruled almost the entire known world during the time. I mean, uh, Esther married the king of Persia, if you read the book of Esther. Come on, somebody. If you've seen the movie 300, the king of Persia was the one that was coming against the Greek empire in the movie 300. Come on, somebody. Are you with me? Huh? And that empire was known as the empire of silver. Everybody say silver. Hmm? The chest and the arms, which represented royalty and strength. The belly and the thighs were bronze. I mean, the, P- the Persian and the Mede Empire was conquered by the Greek Empire. Is everybody getting a good history lesson? There was a dude in the Greek Empire named Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great's men were known for taking copper, come on somebody, and mixing it with brass and making their shields out of bronze and making all their swords out of bronze. That was the empire of bronze. And they ruled the whole known world. How I many know after the Greek Empire stood... Along came an empire called the Roman Empire. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? The Roman Empire shows up on the scene, and they are known as the Empire of Iron. According to Daniel's prophecy, thousands of years before, they would be the legs of iron in the statue. The Empire of Iron. Rome's iron hand. Rome's iron rule. The roads of Rome of iron. Come on, somebody. Everything about the Roman Empire had to do with iron. How many know it was represented by two legs? If you know anything about history, then you recognize that the Roman Empire, after Christianism and the Council of Nicaea, was split into two empires. One empire went to the east of Europe. The other went to the west part of Europe. One empire ruled for about another hundred years and was defeated. And that's where you got the kingdoms of England and France and all of the Norwegian kingdoms that rose up and the Vikings. Come on, somebody. But the other empire stayed around until 1453 in a city called Constantinople, who were later defeated. Come on. Amen. They were later defeated. And then the, and then the Islamic region took over Turkey, which is today known as Istanbul. Right? Then it says, out of the legs of iron were two feet with ten toes, with iron and clay mixed. We know that today as the European Union. And we know that thing has been fractured. It said the feet would be like iron, but it would be mixed with ceramic where it would crumble from time to time and be put back together. I mean, if we've seen anything in the European Empire, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. We got Brexit, probably going to have Frexit. Hmm? There are 27 nation states in the European Union, and combined, all together, they make the largest nation on the planet. The most powerful nation on the planet, if they could ever come together. The struggle has been in the European Union is that nobody speaks the same language. There's so many different races. There's so many different cultures. There's so many different ethnicities. They can't get everybody on the same page at the same time. So it stays fractured. This was the picture that Daniel paints for Nebuchadnezzar. And he prophesied the whole world until the end of the age. I mean, we're living in the end of the age today, ladies and gentlemen. We're living in the end of the age today. Huh? That's Daniel chapter 2. We get to Daniel chapter 3. He's done promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's promoted Daniel... And all of a sudden, some time goes by, and the king keeps thinking about this statue. And he says, you know what? Since I am going to be the first nation, the most powerful nation, the head of all kingdoms to come after me, I'm going to build me a statue. I'm going to build me a 90-foot tall statue. Hmm? And what's going to happen is I'm going to put it out in the middle of the plain. And I'm going to have musicians play music to this statue. 
And when the music is played, everybody in the whole empire is going to bow down to this statue. You see the problem? He let it go to his head. I think we got some people in our country in charge that just let it go to their head. Come on, somebody. When God is meaning for something entirely different, we have the unique ability to take something good like a country, the United States of America, that's supposed to be based on individual freedom and turn it into a divided state and eat each other alive. I lost all my helpers. Come on, amen. Hmm? And he builds this, he builds this statue and he tells them, they got to bow down. That's a lot like America today. We worship everything but Jesus. Huh? Come on, we worship everything but Jesus. The knees of our society bow down to materialism. Come on, all we do is we go out and get all we can get and put it in our garage, and then we don't want to clean the garage. Hmm? We buy all these great things, stick them in the garage, and they just stay in the garage. I'm preaching a thing right now. Come on, huh? Humanism, materialism, moral relativism, where everything is right in everyone's eyes. Well, if you believe it to be true, then it's true. Well, what if your truth disagrees with my truth? It's okay. We're both right. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. Come on, huh? I mean, there's no absolute truth anymore in this nation. Not anywhere in government. There is no absolute truth. And I believe we're being confronted as the body of Christ whether or not we're going to continue to bow down to the gods of materialism and we're going to continue to bow down to the gods of humanism and moral relativism. There's something like a disease in this nation that the only cure for is the believer. Are you here this morning? Amen. I believe we're being confronted whether we're going to let God arise or not, whether we're going to stand or not. That's what I believe. Amen. How many recognize this morning as we begin to stand in the world today, we need to understand that when we do, there's going to be consequences when we stand. Huh? There's going to be consequences when we stand. There's going to be consequences if we decide that we're going to stand for what God told us to do versus what the government told us to do. You're going to have to pay a price. Hmm? Uh, y'all with me? Is everybody all right? We need to turn the air down or do y'all want me to stop? Come on. Amen. Matthew says, five, chapter 5, chapter, verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for their, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you're getting in trouble for messing up, then that ain't a big deal. You deserve what you got. But if you're getting in trouble for doing something right, then the Bible says you're blessed. Somebody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Hmm? So we have to decide whether we want to take a stand or not. Huh? And I believe that as a church that calls on the name of the Lord, we need to decide we're either for what God's doing or we're for whatever's happening in the culture. There has to be a line in the sand where we declare we're with the kingdom of God. Yes. We're not with the kingdom of this world. Amen. Right. And then when we take that stand, we have to understand that there's probably going to be some consequences for it. I mean, a lot of pastors got arrested and tossed in jail for having church. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Come on, y'all ought to help me. Yeah. They had a funeral a month ago. A bunch of Jewish people went to a funeral and they arrested them for going to a funeral. They had a funeral this week. They didn't arrest nobody. Come on. There's consequences. There's consequences when you take a stand for what is right. Come on, huh? Hmm? And listen, you and I don't get to choose the consequence what they're going to be. We just have to trust God that he's going to keep us through the consequences when we take a stand. Now, I believe that the goodness of God is out there for those that come by faith. And I just happen to believe that there's an abundance. So if we're obedient to God in this nation today, we're going to see revival. So I just happen to believe good things are coming. I'm believing, how many believe in God for good things? Yeah. I'm believing God's going to turn around the nation. Yeah. I believe we're going to have revival in the nation. Yeah. I believe people are going to repent in this nation. huh? Yeah. I don't deny that the stuff is out there. I just believe he's greater. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's what they were facing that day. They refused to bow down. And the king calls them in. He said, you guys, you're embarrassing me. How can you do this? I promoted you. I took you out of bondage, out of slavery. I put you in charge. Why won't you bow down? I put you in positions of authority. Now everybody thinks I'm an idiot, king, for making, giving you authority. They're all bowing down. You're not bowing down. You're not acting like everybody else. 
You're standing up. Why are you doing that? Huh? And this is what they said. They said, listen here, King, here's the deal. Our God will deliver us. He'll deliver us. We're not going to bow down. If you throw us in the furnace, our God will deliver us. He'll either deliver us out of it or he'll deliver us through it. Either way, we're going to be with God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hmm? You say, well, that's a lack of faith. No, that's not a lack of faith. That's putting your trust in God. I mean, that's what believers did in the early church. So his deliverance comes to us in the midst of it or it comes to us to get us out of it. One way or the other, we're going to be with God. Tell somebody, one way or the other, I'm going to be with God. Hmm? In other words, King, whatever you do to us, either way, God's going to save us. In death or life, God is going to save me. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so, hotshot King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not dying at your hand. We're not going to die at your hand. Hmm? I, I, I think we need to be ready in this culture to recognize that we're not going to die at somebody's hand. When it's time to go, it's time to go. But we got to take a stand. So I don't like this kind of preaching. Where's the bless me preaching? Where's, the, where's all the blessings in the favor of God and money in my bank account preaching? I don't like this kind of preaching, Pastor. Listen, you're going to have to take a stand. There is a line in the sand. You're going to have to take a stand. Tell somebody I'm going to have to take a stand. Now listen, uh, full disclosure here, I am no fan of pain, okay? I don't like to be tied up, I don't like to be handcuffed, I don't like to be kicked, I don't like to be drug around, I don't like none of that stuff. I like the peace, fun, and exciting things. Hmm? I like to dance, run, and have a good time, and laugh. I'm that kind of Christian. Amen. Praise the Lord, amen? amen? That's one of the reasons why I chose to be a Christian. Hmm? I chose to go to heaven instead of hell. I looked at hell and I said, hell's hot. It's painful. It's miserable. The Bible says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're going to be tormented day and night. I don't like it. On the other hand, I have a choice. There's a place called heaven where I get to walk down streets of gold, swim in crystal seas, laugh. Have joy, have peace, hang out all day. I'm going to take heaven. Hmm? Now, if given the choice of whether or not I want to go through a very painful time in my life versus not having to go through a very painful time, I'm going to choose not having to go through a very painful time. How many of you are with me? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hmm? But here's what I understand. Donald Trump, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the Senate, the Supreme Court does not have the final word on my life. God has the final word on my life. You do not have the final word on my life. I do not have the final word on your life. The county sheriff does not have the final word on my life. The mayor does not have the final word on my life. God all by himself has the final word on my life. That's why I can stand up today and know no matter what happens to me in this life, whether it's a good life pain-free or it's a life with a lot of pain, either way, I'm going to spend eternity with God. And this life is going to be but a momentary lapse in my memory because in eternity with Him, I'm going to be in a place of peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, when I get a revelation of that and I have an understanding that God has the final word on my life, how many of you know that gives me peace? In the midst of turmoil. That means the world can go crazy around me. It can be on fire. It can be divided. It can be in discord. Politics can be out the window. People on the news can go crazy. But I can understand that all that stuff is happening. I can still have peace. Because God's got the final word on my life. How many grateful he's got the final word on your life today? That's why it's okay to wake up and declare, I ain't bound down. I ain't shutting up. I ain't backing up. I ain't bound down. I'm going to proclaim the kingdom of God with every last breath I've got. Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody ought to praise the Lord with me. Amen. Now listen, I've been all the way around the world. I've been in military combat. I've dealt with death. I've got all kinds of life experiences that most people that live on the planet will never have to deal with. I've been to the Middle East. I've been to the Persian Gulf. I've been to Europe. I've been to the Norwegian states. And I'm going to tell you something. 
This is by far the greatest place on the earth to live if you're a live human being. The United States of America. There is no doubt, hands down, there are countries that will throw you off the top of a building if they think you're gay and crucify you in the street. There are countries that I have visited that if you say the name of Jesus, they will pull you out of your tent into the road and slit your throat in front of your family for proclaiming the name of Jesus. That is a reality in the world that we live today. There is no greater place to live than this nation right now. Let's just be upfront about that. But there is pressure in this nation. There is struggle in this nation. There is racism in this nation. There is injustice in this nation. This nation needs the love of Jesus Christ more than anything. And it's up to us to bring it. But we have to make a decision that we will not bow down to political pressure, to hatred, to division. Come on, somebody help me. Am I preaching a good word? Are y'all okay? Hmm? Listen to me. They went into that furnace. It was so hot that the guys that threw them in died. Isn't that cool that God will even take care of your enemies if you trust him? Hmm? He said, they bound me up and threw me in the furnace. Well, they died. Come on, somebody. Amen? In other words, you don't have to be afraid of anything that comes to your life if you trust Jesus. You might have to go through a few things, but you don't have to be afraid. Because he's got the final word on your life. Somebody say, he's got the final word on my life. The biggest thing that we have to deal with is the fear. The fear is sometimes a hundred times worse than the reality of what you walk through. Because when you walk through it, you walk through it with the power of God. We get more uptight about the unknown than we do the known. That's where trusting the Lord comes into play. Amen? Hmm? I mean, when that king went down, I looked down there in that furnace to look in to see how those guys were roasting. He wanted to check on them, see how they were cooking up. He looked in the furnace. There were four guys in there. He put three in, and they multiplied. He said, didn't we throw three of them in there? There's four of them in there. Huh? And then he recognized that the three of them that were in there weren't be burning up. Matter of fact, their clothes weren't even on fire. Their turbans weren't even on fire. They were not dying. They were not screaming. They weren't in pain. They weren't miserable. They weren't in agony. They were in there having a good time. They were in there praising God. Stop throwing them coals at me. You're blinding me. Shadrach, calm down. Just calm down. Don't dance too much. You're spreading up all the sparks I can't see. Come on. Somebody said they was having a good time in the furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace. He said, I ain't never seen nothing like that. I've never seen nothing like that. And watch this. The fourth person in the furnace, the Bible says, was the presence of the Lord. Hmm? He was in the flames in the furnace, but he wasn't being burnt. Come on, how many of something like that happened in a desert with Moses in a bush? Huh? See, sometimes it's okay to get on fire for the Lord. You just got to understand, you're not going to burn up if you get on fire. I say, let it burn, baby, burn, baby, burn. I'm going to be burning for the Lord. We used to sing it in the Holy Ghost Church a long time ago. Give me all for my lamp, keep me burning. Give me all for my lamp, I pray. Give me all for my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. I didn't mean to hurt your ears, but somebody needs to burn. (laughs) Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm on fire. When you do that, when you trust God, he upsets the apple cart of fear in your life. Uh, When you praise him in the midst of it all, when you get out around your friends that are all falling apart, I dare you to go down to Fort Pierce at 4 o'clock today to the protest and just get out there and raise your hand and just start, Jesus, you're amazing. Bring some peace. Bring some joy. Bring some love. Come on, bring some unity to the community. They need it. We need it. Healing needs to take place. And only the people of God can do it. Praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. There's nothing natural about praising and dancing in the middle of a fire. Ain't nothing natural about it. 
You've got to be determined to praise the Lord in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the struggle. You've got to be determined, be determined to give God all the glory when you're walking through something that you don't understand. Amen. When it don't make sense. Amen. I'm going to praise him anyway. Huh? Listen to me. If you ain't been hiding the word in your heart, then it's hard to praise him. If you ain't been spending time with Jesus, it's hard to praise him when you get in the middle of something. If you haven't turned your life over to the Lord, you can't praise him when it gets tough. All you do is agree with the enemy. Oh, the world's going down the tubes. Yeah, it's going down the tubes. Everybody's going to kill. There's going to be a race war. Yeah, everybody's going to kill. Everybody. You better run and hide. You better get up into the mountains in West Virginia and take all your guns and bullets. Come on, some of y'all, come on, some of you white people have been thinking it. I know. You count your bullets because they ain't nowhere to buy any right now. Hmm? For everybody's afraid of everybody. I'm telling you, you ain't got to be afraid of nothing today. You are the answer to the world's problem. You are the solution. God is sending his people as a light in this dark world to bring his peace and his love. It don't matter how hot the furnace gets. They can heat it up seven times. They can riot in the street. They can burn down your business. I want to declare to you today that he is God all by himself. He can bring healing through you. He can bring a miracle through you. He can touch this land that we live in and cause the hearts of men to be united again. He's just looking for a few good people to stand up and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. Come on, Carol. The only thing that burned up in the furnace on them boys was the ropes that bound them. That's the only thing that burned. I'm telling you, in the presence of God, in the presence of Almighty God, when you get there, the only thing you got to worry about being subtracted from your life are the things that have bound you. Amen. The mindsets, the conclusions, the fear, the preconceived notions. Listen, I'm glad that we are a multicultural church. I thank God that we are. But you better hear me. The rest of this nation we live in is not like this church. And listen to me, white people. There is, I don't care what you think, there is racism in the nation. There is. And it's incumbent upon all of us to extend a hand of healing to our brothers and sisters that don't look the same on the outside, but we know are the same on the inside. God has called us as His people to bridge the gap. What you see in here on Sunday morning is not like this in every church. Most churches are either all brown, they're all white, or they're all black. And a lot of it has to do, I understand, with culture and style of music, but there's still a percentage of people in those churches that don't want to be around people of, the, of another race. And I'm telling you today that that's not in the kingdom of God. Everybody in this room, our DNA is the same. It's the same. And listen to me. It's incumbent upon those of us that are here today to empathize with those that are different than us. That's how healing comes. Now, I'm not talking about different on the inside. We're all brothers and sisters. I'm talking about the difference on the outside because a lot of people live in a different reality because they're judged for their appearance on the outside. Are you hearing me? That's why we've got to be the example. Now, I know everybody in this room, there ain't no racist in this room today. We all love each other. I know that. I know that. That means that, means that who we are as the people of God has to be spread to our community because whether you believe it or not it is not like that in our community it's incumbent upon us as Christians it's incumbent upon us as God's people to bring healing to our community I don't always know what that looks like but I know it starts with listening and we need to listen 
to people who have experiences that are different than our own. Come on, somebody, let's stand to our feet this morning. All over this room, I believe God is calling us to be healers. He's calling us to be people of redemption and reconciliation. Go lift your hands all over there and say, Father, I'm going to stand. I'm going to let God arise in my life, in my house, and in my community. I will not back down from what's happening around me. But I will be the answer that you've called me to be. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you mean that today, put your hands together and give God a big round of applause. Somebody ought to praise Him today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.